evening. Welcome to the 16th annual Paul L. Arrington Lecture. We're happy you could make it this evening, and um, there are still plenty of uh, aisle seats down towards the front if you want to move down. <clears throat> Paul L. Arrington <clears throat> was a staff member at Iowa State University in the Department of Zoology, later to become the Department of Animal Ecology. For 30 years of his career, Paul Arrington is a <clears throat> a major name in the field of wildlife science and wildlife biology and the field of zoology as well. He came to Iowa State fresh out of graduate school from Wisconsin. He's from the Midwest. He was from the Midwest. He grew up in South Dakota. He was a farm boy on a farm that his, his own parents homesteaded. He grew up near a whole chain of glacial lakes that he spent a lot of time at in his boyhood. He had what a lot of people I imagine here in the audience have themselves, and that's a great enthusiasm for the out-of-doors and just a real innate feeling for liking to be in the out-of-doors. Yet as a child, he had a long desire, a long-time desire to <clears throat> go to the North Country. I'm not sure if London or whoever might have inspired him to do so, but he was inspired to go to the North Country fresh out of high school. He was going to go to the district of Patricia in far Canadian north was his desire. And he took his gear and headed north. He got as far as Minnesota. <laughs> and he spent one entire winter in Minnesota camping out, learning more about himself and more about nature. He wanted to be a naturalist in that day and age naturalists weren't all that common and for a farm boy to be want a natu to be a, want to become a naturalist was a little bit uncommon <clears throat> he was obviously looking for more than just becoming a naturalist he was looking for himself and he was seeking directions and guidance uh, from some local um, Indian trappers and they directed him to go down a certain river and he almost took a certain river and it was almost the end of his career in the life right there it was a very bad set of ra rapids, and we saw the rapids and saw what he almost went into. He decided he better go back to South Dakota to the farm and grow up a little bit more before he met the world. So he went back to South Dakota, <clears throat> started farming with his parents. By then, his buddies, his friends, some of his friends he'd gone to high school with, were <clears throat> attending South Dakota University, majoring in agronomy and some of the more relevant subjects of the world. And they, they kind of encouraged um, Paul to come out and, and see what they were doing once in a while. And he wasn't very enthusiastic about going to school. After all, he grew up in, in the wild and knew just about, there was, just about everything there was to know. But a very insightful, a very sightful, I should say, a very um, sensitive teacher by the name of Dr. Earl Oreck sort of noticed Paul as a, as a young man, as a young student who had a, a lot of enthusiasm and he, he noted that sparkle that it took to be a dynamic naturalist. And he also sensed that he couldn't just sort of say to Paul, you should go back to school because that's where you learn it all. He said, gee, when you're skinning out those, those skunks and those muskrats and so forth, you ever notice all those parasites that's, uh, that are inside of those animals? Uh, what, are, what are the name of those? And Paul said, I, I don't know. He says, maybe you ought to think about taking a course in parasitology or some other course that will help you learn, help you in your field work. So he was lured back into taking a course or two. He went on to do his undergraduate work there at the University of South Dakota. And from there he went on to the University of Wisconsin where he studied uh, Bob White Quail for his PhD. His, his uncle was a, a fairly well-established name in plant pathology and he was working in Washington DC and his uncle persuaded him to apply to a, uh, a fellowship and he was awarded that fellowship. So fresh out of school he came to Iowa State University in the early 30s and he remained here until his death in 1962. The very day that Dr. Arrington passed away, 
the chairman of of the of the Department of Zoology and Entomology uh, at that stage, uh, Oscar uh, Tauber. He he called Carolyn Arrington that very same day. Of course, a very difficult day for anybody. And he said, Mrs. Arrington, <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be sending in money and sending in gifts and sending in things that for, in memory of, uh, of Paul. And um, I thought it might be a good idea if we had a memorial lecture in, in honor of <clears throat> Dr. Arrington. And so one year later, they started the first Arrington lecture. <clears throat> Dr. Druid Allen was the first speaker, as you see on the back of your uh, program this evening. He was a close friend of Dr. Arrington. Even in this long list of Hall of Fame, just about, of, of outdoor wildlife scientists, um, included some of, of Dr. Arrington's uh, former graduate students. The obvious purpose of this evening is to <clears throat> pay attribute to Dr. Arrington and also to pay attribute to other scientists in the tradition of Dr. Arrington of being an active and enthusiastic field biologist, be they involved with wildlife or zoological studies. But as you can see from this uh, program, from the previous Arrington lectures, there have been people who have been wildlife orientated, fisheries orientated. So the speaker this evening is, was this year's nomination, this year's selection as a person we felt that carried on the, on the tradition of, of Dr. Arrington. Dr. Roger S. Payne is a well-known international whaleologist. Is that right? He is very well known for his work uh, in South America and other parts of the world, particularly uh, Peninsula Valdez, which, uh, which is on the east coast of South America. He spent many years down there with him, with his family. He has graduate students down there uh, continually for, for the past number of years. And he's contributed a tremendous amount in our understanding of whale communication. Obviously, it's still on the frontier, as we learned this afternoon in a very fine presentation he gave on long-range communication among whales. But this evening, Dr. Payne will share with us uh, additional information as to what we're now learning on whale communication. Dr. Payne uh, received his education at Cornell University. Um, he had a similar route of travel, perhaps, to Dr. Arrington. Fresh out of school, he went right into his, fresh out of his undergraduate work, he went right into his PhD work and tackled it hard and, and did some work on um, predator orientation of owls and, and perceiving and finding prey. Today he's located as an adjunct member of the um, Rockefeller University and he's a member of the staff of the New York Zo Zoological Society. We're very privileged to have Dr. Payne here this evening <clears throat> and we'd like to turn the remainder of time over to you, Roger. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. I never knew Dr. Arrington and always wished I had. I certainly knew of his work all through my schooling and have had occasion to refer to it many times. I've always felt that whenever talking about whales, it's necessary somehow to get everybody calibrated to the animals that we're talking about. And since uh, they're so large that it's almost hard to understand or comprehend how large they are, over a series of years, I've collected together a sort of miscellaneous bits of what might be described as cocktail party information about whales, which uh, somehow help to give an idea of just how large whales are. They're, of course, the largest animals that have ever lived on Earth. They're in weight something like two and a half to three times as heavy as the largest dinosaur that's ever lived. And the species of whale which attains that greatest weight and greatest length is the so-called blue whale which is, of course, now very close to extinction over much of its former range. That's true, one might say, of all the species of whales which have been hunted in recent years, but it's a situation which I hope is now starting to turn around and that there can be, indeed, some future for them. 
a large blue whale gets as large as, or as long as about 100 feet in length. It weighs about as many tons, about a ton per foot. And uh, just to give you an idea of how long 100 feet is, if a blue whale uh, makes the simple maneuver of going from a horizontal position to a vertical position, of course it has to be in 100 feet of water to do it, just to make that simple change. But if it uh, goes into a vertical posture, the pressure on the tip of its nose is three atmospheres, whereas the pressure, is, I mean, three atmospheres greater than the pressure on the tip of its tail when it's in a vertical position. Uh, a baby blue whale in the first few uh, weeks of life makes a net gain. This is based on mother's milk, so you can imagine what the production of mother's milk was like, of about 500 pounds per day. <laughs> <coughs> so if you looked at a baby blue whale and say, isn't he growing, you really would be right. <laughs> the, um, uh, also, if uh, when a whale is an adult, as a blue whale, if the heart is rem when the heart is removed, the aorta, which as you'll recall is the main blood vessel leaving the heart, is large enough in cross-section for a child to crawl through. So as I've mentioned in these notes, this is a new way to study the anatomy of an animal by crawling around through its arteries and veins. <laughs> the, uh, well, with that brief introduction, I want to say some things about uh, blue whales and their relatives, and then I want to go on from there to humpback whales, and I will leave out almost entirely tonight any discussion of right whales, which is an animal that we've spent, in fact, most of our time on during the last 10 years. Uh, that's another whole story. We have not gotten as much information about the communication of right whales as we'd hoped, but we've learned quite a lot about their population and social structure and some very fascinating forms of behavior that they have, but that's, I'll put that aside and, and uh, maybe on another occasion. In any case, uh, if we can start out, please, with the first slide, I'll try to uh, get us oriented as to the whales that we're discussing. This slide shows uh, at the top a pair of species which are very closely related, the so-called bowhead whale, which is at the very top, and the right whale. The right whale is the one we've studied so much in Patagonia. They're very closely related, as I've said. They have uh, been little studied until very recently, and now the bowhead whale is a subject of much controversy between the Eskimos in northern Alaska and uh, the United States government. In fact, a major suit, which will almost certainly get all the way up to the Supreme Court, concerns that struggle, that fight. The Eskimos insist that their culture is dependent upon the bowhead whale and that asking them to not hunt the bowhead whale, which is a critically endangered species, perhaps the most endangered of all whales, if it's a toss-up as to whether it or the right whale is, uh, this means that, that probably cessation of hunting or at least redu reduced hunting is an essential if uh, bowheads are to su survive Eskimos. Um, I might say that this particular problem has concerned me quite a lot. I've been concerned with it. I feel strongly about it because in at least some of the hunting done by the Eskimos, there is not, as the Eskimos claim, the slightest vestige of the original culture of the Eskimos anywhere in the hunt. For example, a man goes out with a fiberglass boat, a well-known invention of the Eskimos, uh, and <laughs> locates a whale, driving up to it using his Eskimo Evinrude, and um, <laughs> having gotten in the vicinity of the whale, he then stands up in the boat and shoots it with a uh, shoulder-fired harpoon gun, another famous Eskimo invention, and attaches to it a plastic float. It turns out to last much longer than seal uh, bladders do. And then he uh, follows this whale until he can exhaust it for a while, then he pulls up closer to it, and uh, shoots it with a grenade-firing shoulder-held uh, gun, another famous Eskimo invention. He then gets, calls up his other friends on a time-worn Eskimo traditional form of communication known as the walkie-talkie, and his other friends, also equipped with their own fiberglass boats powered by outboard mortars, come out and help him tow, using nylon rope, the whale back into shore. When they get it to shore, they use the absolute central item of Eskimo culture, the bulldozer, to pull it up onto the beach. <laughs> uh, having pulled the whale up onto the beach, it is then <coughs> massacred, is cut, cut up with steel knives and carried away on either snowmobiles or pickup trucks and is stored underground. Now there, maybe that part of it is part of the traditional Eskimo culture. It is stored for periods until it is served on two traditional Eskimo feasting days, Christmas and Thanksgiving. Um, I think this whole thing is in fact uh, just a travesty and uh, there's so little question in my mind that 
uh, this sort of hunting should be brought under control, and I think the whole argument is just silly, frankly. But unfortunately, it is far more than silly in the real world, where people have to deal with aggrieved feelings, and as a result, it's become a very hot issue. You'll hear much more about it, not from me, I, um, but from, from others. Well, in addition to this pair of species, then, there's a sort of oddball species off by itself, the gray whale, about which all of you have heard. They make long migrations coming, staying close to shore, and can be seen easily from the California coastline. There is then this group of species, the so-called Balanoptera, they're all in the same genera, genera, which are closely related and essentially have the same body form and just come in different sizes. And they have one peculiar and fascinating thing in common, which is that they all make very low and very loud noises in as much as they've been studied, they've been found to make these sounds. Then finally, at the bottom, a species normally lumped together with these as one of the so-called Rorqual species, which is the humpback whale, the one which sings songs and about which I'll have lots to say tonight. We've studied humpbacks for about 10 years, uh, bowhead, b uh, I mean uh, right whales for about 10 years, and I've done some brief work with finback whales and the rest I've just sort of encountered in coming and going. But there's an interesting uh, sort of lucky choice about these animals in that this group of species lives in very shallow water and has very soft voices. I mean, these animals have soft voices. These live in very deep water, at least in one portion of the year, and have extremely loud and deep voices. And the humpback whale lives uh, half the time in shallow water, half the time in deep water, and is the only animal which is known to sing such uh, sort of wild and weird and lovely songs that they sing, which, about which I'll, I'll say more in a while. Well now, when I say a whale sings a song, I don't mean to imply some aesthetic judgment of the beauty of the song, even though in fact it is beautiful to human ears often. But what I mean to say is exactly the biological definition of singing that everyone uses whenever they've encountered an animal which is repeating itself. You say, rightly therefore, that a cricket sings, or a bird sings, or a frog sings, and all you mean is that this animal monotonously repeats what it has said before again and again and again. Well, humpback whales do exactly that, but there's a difference between humpback whales and bird and cricket and frog songs, and that is that humpback songs are repeated after, with no pause between songs, and the songs themselves are also exceptionally long. The shortest I've ever heard is six minutes, the longest 30 minutes, with an average being about 15 minutes from end to end of the song. Um, this singing is accompanied by humpbacks by breathing and the breaths, much as with a human singer, are tucked in between elements of the song. Usually the whale breathes at exactly the same moment in the song, but sometimes it does not. Sometimes it chooses a different portion of the song in which to catch a breath, but it always tucks the breath in in such a way that it does not interfere with the rhythm of singing. Rather interesting in that it's similar to a human being singing, tucking breaths in in such a way as to not interfere with the song. Um, the finback whale, this second largest of all the whale species right down here, closely related to the blue, which is the largest of all the species, the finback whale also, technically speaking, sings, but it's a mighty monotonous song, rather like a cricket song, in that it's just a single note repeated endlessly, hour after hour. These sounds are loud enough to travel enormous distances, something I talked about quite a lot this afternoon, and when they were first discovered, people couldn't believe that they even occurred from within the ocean. And for a while, there were efforts to determine whether the sounds were coming from the ocean or were they coming from earthquakes in the earth or from the, some strange phenomenon of surf on distant continental shorelines. Such loud sounds suggest an animal which can communicate over long distances, and it turns out that the construction of the sounds produced by fin whales is as if ideally designed for long-range communication. If you make calculations of how far these sounds can go, you come up with calculations of dis distances, which I'll get to in a moment, enough to carry the voices across entire portions of the range in which the whales are living, as long as we're talking about deep water. Well, now, just to give you a sample of what these sounds like, I've brought these sounds are like from finback whales and from blue whales, their close relatives. I've brought a tape with me which has a series of sounds, first of finback whales, and then towards the very end, you'll hear a blue whale sound. Then we'll, now, in order to hear the sounds, they're around 20 cycles per second, and, and most of us have lost our ability to hear 20 cycles per second. What we've done is to speed them up one octave. So what you will be listening to tonight is the sort of speeded up Mickey Mouse version of what these sounds are like. But if you'd like to know what they're really like, you'd have to 
uh, imagine them as down another octave below what you're actually hearing. If I was capable of playing these sounds to you as loud as they are produced by the whale, it would blow you right out of the auditorium. You'd be running for your life. Uh, we can come as close as possible. That's what these loud speakers are for. So hang on to your chair, and I'll try it. <laughs> This is an octave too high. Therefore, it's going at twice the speed it would normally go when the whale was producing the sounds. Now, this is the finback, and in a while, along comes the blue whale. This is the blue whale. rattling you're hearing are, uh, is objects in the room. Now, if <coughs> by, by that I mean to say that the, the sound, it, the original sound, does not include any of the sort of rattles you hear. In order to hear these sounds properly, you have to go through a room and remove every rattling panel in the ceiling and any object which itself can vibrate in sympathy with the sounds and then play them and then you hear that indeed there is no such uh, accompanying sound. Now, if we... Uh, Let's now go and speed that already sped up sound up another octave so we can listen to the fact that the sound made by a blue whale is actually a slow frequency sweep downward with sort of pauses at a couple of frequencies along the way. I haven't time to go into why I think those pauses occur, but they're very interesting. This is another octave higher. And just another example to hear it better again. Now we'll take it and go back an octave lower, so it's still an octave too fast. something I find about that sound is I think it's one of the saddest, loveliest sounds I've ever heard in my life. It's, um, I've listened to hours of tapes of this sort of thing, and it's, somehow I never tire of it. Maybe I'm crazy. <laughs> uh, <coughs> in any case, um, if you calculate the distances to which these sounds can propagate before they have fallen to a level which is equal to the background noise level in the ocean, you come up with some remarkable distances, which are on the order of thousands of miles. I've misplaced my slide. It'll come up in just a moment, because I forgot that I wanted to show you a picture right now about of right whales, which are another species that we've studied, but which makes very faint sounds and nowhere near as low as the sounds you've just heard. I'm showing them at this point to try to emphasize that only a few species of whales are capable of making these low, loud sounds. There's another way that right whales have of making noise, and that's to jump into the air and crash back into the water with an enormous splash. And when they do that, the sounds they generate can be heard for several miles, or maybe 10 or 15 miles at most, but nowhere out to the ranges in which one actually found sounds, finds sounds being made by finback whales. Those ranges are shown over here on the right-hand side. There are two different conditions of spreading of the sound. One is by spherical spreading, the other is by using channels which conduct sound effectively in the ocean. 
And you see that, that a whale is capable in this century before the ocean began being polluted by, I mean, now that the ocean is polluted by ship's noise of about 45 miles by spherical spreading, but that before ship's traffic noise filled the oceans as badly as it did, they should have been hearing each other out to several hundred miles. And if you use this other assumption of deep uh, uh, channels in the ocean as a means of propagation of sound, that then they could have heard out to several thousand miles and been able, presumably, any one whale to hear any other member of its species within the same ocean basin. Well, that's all I want to say about finback whales. I want to now turn my attention to um, humpback whales, a species which we studied in two areas, both off Bermuda in the Atlantic Ocean and off Hawaii in the Pacific. There's a problem about talking of whales which always sort of bothers you when you're giving a lecture, and that is that somehow one would like to convey to his audience some feeling of what it's like to be out on a boat and studying a group of whales, seeing it sometimes uh, for the first time, sometimes doing things that you've never seen before. Humpback whales spend lots of time singing at night, and so in Bermuda we were often anxious to be out as we were anxious to be out at night as often as possible, and we would go off in small sailboats using sailboats because they don't make any noise and travel for long periods of time, uh, day and night, recording sounds of whales all the time. There's a sort of a beautiful, uh, mazy motion of a sailboat at sea. They, they, they um, dip and curtsy and bow, and it's always moving. And at night, you see the mast sweep across fields of stars up above your head while through headphones that you're wearing. And as you lie in the cockpit of the boat, you feel the whole ocean essentially singing this incredible music pouring up to you out of the sea. I remember particularly well one night, which was on the 13th of April in 1970, when we had been out during a very rough day, but suddenly the wind began to calm. And as evening came along, we decided we'd stay out overnight. And I remember trying to see Bermuda, which was by then so far away that the only thing left visible was the tip of Gibbs Hill Light, which is the highest point on land. All the rest of the island was beneath the horizon. And I remember trying to sight on this thing and seeing it almost as a, as a tiny star right near the horizon. Sometimes it probably was a star that I thought I was seeing, and other times it was Gibbs Hill Light. And there's a sort of frustration about everything you do in working in the ocean because it's so much more difficult than doing this, such a simple thing on land. And yet that's part of the joy, part of the beauty of being in a place like that, surrounded by animals and by the sea. And that particular evening has produced a series of sounds, which I'll play you examples of a little bit later on. But I can't bring all that with me. All I've brought is the sounds. And so you'll have to try to imagine, essentially, what you're trying to imagine is something which is stripped completely away from all of the masts and the stars and the night air and the lying in the boat and the motion of the whole thing. And it's just reduced to nothing but a simple recording of sounds made by whales. It's only a tiny part of the whole experience of having this wonderful chance to study whales. Well, <coughs> I've mentioned that we have been studying humpback whales, and that shows a humpback whale, this time taken in Hawaii, doing the same sort of jumping that humpback whales do, off, I mean that right whales do, which I showed you before, attendant with these incredible splashes. And that is indeed one of the forms of communication as we found by studying these whales for long periods of time, which humpback whales use to keep together uh, as members of a herd. The other form of communication which they frequently use is to hold their tail in the air and slam the surface of the water with their tails, or alternately they hold their flippers in the air. That's the great, long, flexible flipper of a humpback head held in the air, and they slam the surface of the water with that. This is a picture of the island of Bermuda, and you can just see, in fact, Gibbs Hill Light, the one I was mentioning right there, uh, with a humpback whale in the foreground to remind us that it is during the springtime migration returning from breeding grounds in the south, passing Bermuda, and going north to feeding grounds, where the whales will spend now about six months of their lives feeding. It is during this period that the whales come close to Bermuda. They are probably not breeding there, although they may be a few individuals that linger in the area to breed. Most of them are breeding farther to the south in uh, the bays of the Caribbean. Uh, of the Caribbean. <coughs> This is a picture of the boat that we've used. That next blow by the whale brought him directly in underneath the boom. 
um, so that he was rolling right next to the boat. And that's one of the pre pleasant things also, is that often you have whales in your company the whole time you're going. And if you lower a hydrophone into the ocean and listen in the vicinity of Bermuda to the sounds that you get, you get sounds which are, as I've said, in long patterns. And since there's not enough time to play even the shortest whale song tonight, I've taken one and speeded it up 14 times, and I'll play it to you back very fast. You'll see one thing that's immediately obvious, that it sounds very similar to a bird song. And indeed, bird songs, when slowed down, sound very similar to whale songs. But, um, <coughs> which is more than funny when you think about it. It means that presumably, physiologically, or neural anatomically speaking, there is a limited repertory which animals have to make sounds, and one can sometimes and in this case with an animal which lives at a much slower rate than does a bird with a metabolism which is a tiny fraction of the rate of a bird's metabolism. Uh, it's sort of curious that their song should be essentially very similar to a bird song. But try to notice another thing, which is that if you try to memorize the very first sounds you hear, you will recognize that after a lot of other garbage that you come back to the very same sounds that you heard before. And this recording I'm playing you is about 1.3 songs long, so you hear about a third of it is overlapping. I'll try to point it out as we go along. After this section is over, you'll hear the whale come right back to where it started. Right there. And now here's the same recording slowed down and to its normal speed. These are all the sounds of one animal, even the low ones going right after the high ones. Now, when a humpback whale is on its breeding grounds, there's lots of socializing between the animals, and there's lots of white water and frantic behavior and so forth. And you often see groups like this, which are traveling so fast together that they're kicking up a wake of water ahead of them and all around them. But when a whale is singing, it's by itself, all alone, sitting still and um, uh, just rising to breathe very quietly, then goes down, stays almost motionless underwater. We have a few observations of whales seen underwater. For a song, the song is composed of a series of units, which are simply means uh, single sounds. You heard maybe just now 20 or 30 units, but these units are organized into patterns, and the patterns we call phrases, so that if we give units different letters to indicate different sounds, a whale might go A, A, B, and then repeat that same phrase, A, A, B, and then repeat it again, A, A, B, A, A, B, A, A, B, and then it goes C, D, E, C, D, E, C, D, E, C, D, E. That's a second phrase and a second theme, and the whole song consists of perhaps uh, six to eight themes, usually, 
Uh, and these themes are very faithfully repeated in order. In other words, the whale does not change the order of what it says in time. All it changes is the number of times that it sings any particular element. So a whale singing in its first song might go A, B, C, A, B, C, or rather A, A, B, A, A, B, A, A, B, B, uh, C, D, E, C, D, E, C, D, E. And the next time it sings, it would go A, A, B, 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 and then C, D, E, and then F, G, H, F, G, H. Only, in other words, changing the numbers of times that anything is repeated. But what it never does is to go C, D, E, A, A, B. It never changes the order of themes. That's an inviolate law. We have well over 1,200 examples in which this does not occur uh, even once. Now, uh, oh, sometimes another form of variation that the whales can have is they sometimes omit a theme entirely, but if we number the themes from one to eight, any one song would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The next time the whale sings it, it might do one, two, four, five, six, seven, eight, leaving out three, but it will never put three in any inappropriate position. It will always keep the order of its, of its uh, phrases. I'll answer a question which I think all of you are concerned about, which is what on earth are these songs all about? We don't know. We don't know what the function of them is. What we do know is that they are probably sung by males. We have quite a lot of evidence now that it is males that are doing the singing, and we have no in examples where females were singing or young ones. The males seem to be adult, and they are sung only during the breeding season. They are not sung during the feeding season, which is the six months that the whales are in polar waters getting tanked up on the food which will, they will use to survive the next entire year. So in a, by sort of parallel guessing from other animals, it looks as though it is a song sung by males to attract a mate. But it has some attributes and characteristics about which I will speak presently, which make that sort of nice, simple, comfortable theory uh, not seem very comfortable at all. And at the present time, we really have no idea what the songs are all about, because humpbacks are an endangered species. This is an endangered mystery. Um, and it's one which is that I'm interested in studying and have been studying for a long period of time. Now, if we take <coughs> the song of a humpback whale and run it through a sound spectrograph, uh, these are all recorded underwater through a hydrophone, which means nothing but an underwater microphone, we find a pattern in which time goes from left to right and in which pitch or frequency goes from bottom to top. So, and the time in this particular case is two minutes from the left side of the screen to the right side of the, excuse me, one minute from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen in that case. And the pitch is on a range of about four octaves from um, down here to up there. And what we see is that any particular sound, which is a continuous tone, let's look at any of those there, uh, would be a horizontal line. And then anything which is changing pitch or frequency very quickly, as is that note right there, would appear to sweep upwards very fast. So I'll imitate a couple of sounds here for you. That one goes sort of whoop, and this one goes hoo, 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 and that one there is a much higher pitched frequency. Now the trouble with sound spectrographs is that they're made by machines, and machines are uh, ignorant, and as a result, the machine can't ignore everything but the whale. It faithfully produces everything which is going on, and that includes a distant passing ship's propeller, which is that long line there. And it includes these blasts of dynamite. The Navy was in the area entertaining itself with dynamite. <coughs> and um, it, in it includes echoes of every individual sound. These are actually just an original single sounds, but it's echoing from the surface of the water and from the bottom. And um, it also includes other whales in the record and so forth. And some harmonics, which for purposes of the kind of analyses that I'm going to talk about now, are not only unnecessary, but really somewhat confusing. So what we've done is to take these spectrographs made by machines and then trace them off over here, bringing away only the fundamental frequencies produced by the whale, leaving everything else behind, presenting the two side by side to keep us honest. And um, what I'll now do is I say there's no time to sit and listen to an entire song go all the way through. What I will do is to play you samples from this song of every one of the six different phrases of which it was composed and I'll point to them as I go. And you can see that where I point, in whatever region I point, there's some other stuff like what I'm pointing to, and then on either side of it there will be different material. Those will be other phrases which you'll hear a moment later. Sorry, I'm right here, yeah.
and the whale makes that same sound, then it starts doing this for a while. And then it starts doing these sorts of noises down here. <coughs> And then it starts doing this sort of phrase right here. Finally, it gets to something which is very simple and continuous, which goes on for a long period of time. This unit right here. Okay. Now, those sounds, if you can sort of keep them in your mind, remember what it is you've heard, those sounds were recorded in Bermuda in 1963. And when we first, when Scott McVeigh and I first discovered that whales were singing, we were very thrilled by this. And, uh, but we had a little problem, which was that we had some tapes, and we had gotten all our tapes, incidentally, from a dear friend, Frank Watlington, in Bermuda, whose generosity has made all this work possible over the years. Uh, because he's gotten a whole series of tapes, we now have many of our own, but the early ones that Frank let us really, lent us really got us going. But Frank had lent us some tapes which did not sound like this, and that was the problem. We had a lot that did, but then we had this other one which was sort of type 2, and we didn't really know what to do with it. But we presented it anyway, and now I'll play you an example of a sound from that song, and you'll see it's unlike anything you've heard before. Now the difference that turned out to be important, and now what I'm describing to you is work that was done by my wife Catherine, the difference that turned out to be important is that that song was recorded in 1961 and the other songs were recorded in 1964, that the, the ones that I played to you just a moment ago. If I said 63 a second ago, I meant to say 64, which is important as you'll see in a second. Let's listen to another year, also recorded in Bermuda, recorded incidentally in exactly the same week that both these previous songs were recorded, only it's now 1970. Listen to this sound, nothing like you've heard before. Now those sounds, um, when we began getting more and more data, we began realizing, or really my wife began realizing, that what was happening is that the songs were changing from year to year. Now an obvious theory to explain what was going on is that simply the whales that were moving into the area were different from year to year, and as a result the, uh, uh, the, po the, the songs that we were hearing are different. But it turned out, as many things do under these circumstances, to be not quite so simple as that. What we did is to start taking type specimens of sounds from different years and using these sounds uh, to, and, and then showing them side by side. Here's some recordings. These are now borrowed from Frank Watlington, made in 1957. Here's one from 58, one from 59. We don't have any example from 1960. We just, he didn't have any recordings that year. Here's 61 that you heard a small section of. You heard, in fact, those two sounds there. And then here's 1963 and 64, and you heard an example of every form of that song. Remember, it had the blasts of dynamite from the naval um, ships. Now, in this case, um, what you'll notice is, let's, let's look at a few things in some of these songs. Notice that downward sweeping element there. 
going down, was present in 57 and at the end of 1958. You can see some sort of strokes downward there. And it was still around in 1959. But you could spend the rest of the evening trying to find it anywhere else in all of the samples of sounds that we have, and you would never find it again. It came, stayed a while, and left, and never reappeared. There are other examples of that all through this data, but the fascinating thing is that when you have years which are close together in time, adjacent years, I'm going to start talking now, it's going to be important in what I say to note what year it is we're talking about, because that's Japan, and, and to point out that some years that are close together, like 1963 and 4, have songs which are virtually identical, whereas those which are far apart do not. So what is happening is that even though the song that you're recording in any one year is different from Bermuda, it is evolving slowly, apparently. In other words, what's happening is not a completely random change, but a change which is a slow transformation. Now, there is no species that's ever been studied of any of the animals which are known to sing, including insects and birds and frogs and several species of mammals, bats and hyraxes and a bunch of other animals, no species for which this sort of thing is true. It's just, as far as we know, a completely unique and strange example. <coughs> We're not just diff dealing with different whales each year, necessarily, because, in fact, if you go out and listen to a whole group of whales that are singing all together and record their songs and then unscramble their songs and figure out who's saying what, you discover that everybody in the group is singing the appropriate song to that particular year but by the time you go back the following year, they are all singing the same song, only now it's a different song, but it contains some of the elements from the previous year. Uh, these, we've, there's a long, complicated analysis, which I will spare you of all of this, uh, but it turns out that apparently there are very specific laws within which these changes occur, and these laws uh, I'll now try to give you a couple of illustrations of. Can we have the lights for just a moment, please? I want to take a phrase which has been sung by the whales in a series of years, actually four years in this case, and I want to draw it on the board, sort of making a pseudo-spectrogram as we go with my hand, and, um, as, and then you'll see that in a series of different years, you can see, get, start to get a feeling for how a whale affects a series of its changes. <laughs> Now that was 1964. Let's look at the previous year. Now let's go three years later. Now let's go one year after that. Notice this is slower, taking him longer to get it out. Now, uh, these sorts of changes have a fascinating common thread running through them, which is that when a whale creates something new, it sings that faster than it ever again sings it. So that as time goes on, it tends to get things slower and slower and slower until finally it drops them out of the song altogether. That seems to be one of the laws of getting rid of something. Anything which is new is sung very fast. I'll give you a really dramatic example that, of that with a phrase which lasted for about six years in the song, and which is still present in the Bermuda population. 
but it's really getting slow by now. This is the phrase that you heard before in another example I played. That's it in one year, and here it is six years later. Okay, well, when you take a series of songs like this and start looking at the laws on which they change, you find out that there are a series of very set rules which are used by the whale to change its song, and these rules are obeyed by all members of the species. We know that it's a group of whales which are singing. We know that they are paying attention to each other and keeping up with all the changes which are occurring. We know that the changes are in some cases very complicated. I haven't given you examples of very complex ones because they're harder to illustrate, but they are there. We know essentially that what we have is an example of cultural transmission. It is perhaps the clearest example of cultural transmission I've ever seen in any species other than man. It also proves very nicely that the whales can not only hear their sounds, otherwise how could they imitate each other if they couldn't hear the sounds that the other one was making, uh, it also says that their brain is capable of the storage of a great deal of material. If you don't believe it, try to memorize one of these songs. It takes about a week to do it. My wife knows now about uh, I guess 12 different years of songs, and it's a tour de force because you can play her a tape from anywhere, and she can say, yes, that's 1964, late in the season, sort of thing. Um, also, I might add, just for sport, that for whatever it's worth, that the songs of the 60s in right humpback whales are much more beautiful than the songs of the 70s. <coughs> One wonders whether there is a muse which oversees all of mankind and all of whaledom and that it's the same muse. <laughs> uh, heaven knows, of course, what sorts of songs have occurred in the past in the ocean and have died out never to be heard again. Incidentally, there is some evidence that humpback whales were present in uh, the Mediterranean and that they were present also in areas, or if they were present there, I would suspect to find them in areas just such as the one between the tip of the boot of Italy and Sicily, uh, formerly known as Scylla and Charybdis. And when you're in a wooden boat and you hear a sound of a humpback singing from the water beneath you, you cannot tell where it's coming from. It's a very strange experience. It's unlike any other sound you've ever heard because the whole hull of the boat is coupling the energy from the sound which is going through the water and it's being broadcast to you from that board and that one and that one and the whole hull all around you. So you don't, it's not like any other sound which occurs when you hear me snap my fingers, you know where it's coming from. When you hear my voice over this thing, you know where the speakers are and the ceiling. Um, but here you cannot tell. It seems to be coming from all around you. It therefore, as a sound, is a very mysterious experience. It's also very lovely. And uh, who can say, maybe this is the origin of the Odysseus myth with Scylla and Charybdis and the sirens singing. Maybe the sirens were nothing but humpback whales. Um, I think that's a pretty impressive type of siren, frankly. Um, in any case, let me try to go on to a different area of the world, which is Hawaii, where we've started doing some work now. And the reason we've gone to Hawaii is not for the hula dances and the Hawaiian guitar songs, but because in that particular area, humpback whales come close to shore, and because there are high mountains in the region which cast a wind shadow uh, in the lee of the trade, trade winds, it's possible to study these whales without having your teeth shaken out of your head the way it happens to you in Bermuda, uh, because you're not in open ocean, you're in protected waters, and the water is clear and most of the time calm and suddenly you can learn a great deal more. The other reason we chose Hawaii is that we wanted to see whether humpback whales in a different ocean also sang songs, and if they did sing songs, whether the songs there were the same as the ones in Bermuda. 
presumably the two populations of whales are completely isolated and have been so for uh, hundreds of years, or I mean, sorry, probably hundreds of generations. In order to get together, they would have to make two trans-equatorial migrations as well as completely circumnavigating the South American continent, and such things are not done by whales, and so it seems unlikely that there's very much gene flow between the two populations. When we first got to Hawaii, one of the reasons we wanted to study whales there was, as, as I said, to see whether they have a dialect, and indeed they do. The humpback whale song in Hawaii in any one given year is quite, in fact, entirely different from the humpback whale song in Bermuda. However, fascinatingly enough, it is constructed on identical laws. So what the whales have done, apparently, is to inherit, either culturally or genetically, we don't know which, a set of laws within which they improvise to produce the songs that you hear. When we had been studying in Hawaii a while, we also discovered that the humpback songs there are changing year after year, just as they do near Bermuda. And an interesting question, or theory rather, presented itself, which was that since this is such a long and complicated procedure to sing a song if you're a whale, that maybe what was happening is that when they went away in the summertime to their feeding grounds and stopped singing, that during that particular period of time they kind of forgot how the song went. So that by the time they arrived back the next year and the whole population was getting together and so forth, they could be going through a, pop a process which by sort of human human description might go as follows, essentially, uh, uh, how did that song go? And uh, everybody attempting to remember it does his best, and where they can't figure out how it goes, they sort of wing it. And uh, <laughs> as, as a result, they have created by the next year a new song. So we were particularly interested to see how the songs at the end of one season uh, compared to the songs at the beginning of the following season. And lo and behold, as is so often the case with anybody's pet theory in biology, we were dead wrong. In fact, the whales are singing almost exactly at the end of one season what they sing in the beginning of the next season. There are differences so slight that they really can't be quantified. The differences may, in fact, be different individuals rather than differences in the song. Now, since the whales are known by people going to the north, including ourselves, and recording and failing to find that the whales are singing in their northern feeding grounds, since the whales are known to not be singing while they're in polar oceans, it means that to store a song is to keep it intact, but that to sing it is to change. And that's another one of the laws with which Hawaiian, with, with which humpback whales are, are w which they possess. The, find my place here a minute. Now, when you're in Hawaii, you're working with a population of whales which is local in the area for periods of time of several weeks or months in terms of individuals. Some are passing through, others are lingering in the region. And there are another number of sounds which you hear from them which are not song sounds. And these sounds, both in Hawaii and Bermuda, seem to be the same. So it's fascinating. There seem to be two vocabularies, one in Hawaii, one in Bermuda, for singing, I mean two different songs, I beg your pardon, uh, but then there's a second vocabulary, one which has to do with sort of social sounds, which one hears, uh, in, uh, hears similar versions of in the two areas. I'll illustrate this with a tape of a whale, or a group of humpback whales, which are sitting near a boat and which eventually charge the boat. Now, this species does not, fortunately, or it wouldn't be here, ever carry through on its charges, but it can scare the daylights out of you. And while they're charging, they're screaming, very similar to elephant noises when they're charging. Interesting, isn't it, that animals so distantly related should have such similar forms of sound under similar social situations. But um, as they charge, they're sort of screaming. The tape recorder gets very badly overloaded because nobody changed it. The gain controls under these circumstances, unfortunately. But, um, and in the end, just before the whale uh, actually makes contact with the hydrophone itself, it dives underneath the boat, goes instantly quiet, and then if you listen, you'll hear a sort of gurgling, which is the water generated in the wake of the whale rattling about the hydrophone. They're sitting off to one side right now. <coughs> and now they're about to start their charge. The charge starts right now.
there you can hear the water in the wake of the whale. Now, what we did in Hawaii was to record whale songs for two complete seasons, and or three complete seasons, and their sort of synopsis of this is shown here. There's a lot to ignore in this slide. Look, you're looking at one year here, a second year there, a third year here, uh, and just, just look at one sample, the one marked 375. That means March of 75, there's March of 76, there's March of 77 right there. And these are sample songs strung out through here, just one phrase from each of the sample songs. And you can see that if you take phrase 4A, for example, right here, and follow it down, you can see how it's changing slowly with time over the years. You can see the same with oh, phrase 1 here, which is breaking up into individual units. And when you do this for a long period of time in a large sample of sounds, we've done this to, I think, 280 songs now, you find that, in fact, there are a series of laws of change which are very easy to characterize. Let's for a moment look at some brief synopses of those laws. This is a series of five periods of time. They are all equal in length, but not equal in size of sample. As a result, this period, the first period of 31 days, these are all 31-day periods, starting in December, January, February, March, April. This 31-day period here has fewer songs recorded than, for example, we got succeeded in getting there. When you go along the vertical line here, you find particular phrases numbered 1 through 8. If we focus that a little bit, that's phrase number 1, I'm sorry, theme 1, theme 2, theme 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, on, so on. And whether the uh, row is marked with black ink or is left white depends upon whether the whale did or did not sing that phrase on that occasion. So here in period 1, you see that, in, and ignore the shades of black here, they're, they're equal for purposes of this discussion. Uh, when you go up from the bottom, you see that in the first song of the first whale, in the first period, he sang that phrase, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, missed that one, and sang that one. The next song that he sang, it's the same whale as long as you're within the same brackets here. The ne next song he sang had all these same phrases. Again, he missed the second phrase, uh, but he also missed the last phrase. And the next time he sang, he missed the second phrase again and got the last phrase. Next, time, next two times, he got this, two, this phrase twice and missed the last phrase twice and so on. You see lots and lots of missing going on in the early days, period one, two, three, but by the time you get in here, you see there is a period of time when no whale ever misses a single sound. Uh, and that's one of the things about the singing season as such, which is that as it goes on, the whales get, get a more and more improved version of their song. Here's an example of another thing which occurs in response to the fact that one whale, it's partly in response to the fact that when whales sing new stuff, they sing it faster than they do later on. It's also responsible for the fact that they start singing more versions of the same phrases, and they sometimes sing longer versions of the same phrases as the season goes on. This is that same five-month period, uh, December, January, February, March, April, and this is the duration of the song in minutes. You see that it goes from about six and a, sorry, seven and a half minutes to over 15 minutes, and these are the 95% confidence limits. In other words, there's absolutely no overlap even in the fourth period with, for instance, the first period. So that the song is getting longer. Recalling that the whales breathe only once per song, you'll have to realize there may be some sort of physiological change going on with them in that they are breathing only half as often later on in the season as they are early. You could say yes, but of course they only sing a short while before they start breathe, before they stop, but no, humpback whales sing so continuously that for a period of time another biologist who's been studying these songs in the Caribbean, Howard Wynn, asked me with a great deal of skepticism in his look and in his voice whether we really ever had heard a humpback stop singing because in fact he never had. Um, we have in fact in Bermuda because apparently they don't sing as consistently there as they do on their breeding grounds, but in the breeding ground area uh, he had a run recording I think for 30 hours of one individual and then he quit. So. Uh, Howard Wynn quit, not the individual, excuse me. <coughs> okay. One doesn't blame him for quitting under those circumstances either. Here is a, uh, something which won't concern us because there's not time. It's a talking about different themes, themes one through eight in the Hawaiian sample of 280 songs over a period of time uh, of one year, 1977. Again, this is the work of my wife and another graduate student, Peter Tyak, who's now at Rockefeller University, and I've helped on along with it myself. This work shows the different emphasis of different themes in the song as time passes along in these same five 31-day periods. But what I'd like to call your attention to here is something called transitional phrases. 
And you'll notice that they, whatever they are, and I'll tell you in a moment, there were lots of them in the first period, and as time went on, they dropped out until in the fifth period, there were none at all. Now, a transitional phrase is one, I'll try to illustrate it by drawing over here, in which the whale takes the tail end of one phrase from one theme and drops it off and splices it together with the very beginning of a phrase in the next theme. So if we're using letters to indicate units, these, individu these are units, individual sounds, those are all units too. Let's say that the whale had been going A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C. He may go A, B, D, E, and then D, E, D, E, excuse me. Make a, well that's one thing they do, but that's slightly modified. Let me, let me give you a clearer example. He might go A, B, E, F, D, E, F, D, E, F. And you see that there is this weird phrase, which is obviously a combination of A, B with the C missing and the D missing going on into E, F. And we call these sorts of phrases transitional phrases for obvious reasons. The whales do lots of them in the early part of the season, and then as the season goes on, they do less and less for reasons best understood by themselves. Um, we don't know what this is all about, but it's sort of curious to speculate. Here's another sort of thing which has, uh, it seems it's such a simple exercise, but it turns out to have sort of fascinating ramifications. These are the same 31 day periods, five of them down here, and we see a whale which is alternating between two different versions of the same sort of unit, or, or I mean two, two different versions of a unit which he's tucking into a phrase. He has a phrase which consists of a lot of those and some of these in every song. And uh, these we call J's and these we call R's, which is just in reference to the appearance that they have as a spectrogram. And this one essentially to imitate it goes whoop, and this one goes whoo, like that. Um, and the two of them are given in some percentage or some proportion over time in each time the whale reaches that particular theme. He gives you a bunch of one and a bunch of the other and he mixes them all up and it's in a sort of random way and it's very hard when you look at the theme to break it down into individual phrases. But if you to see, uh, and these unevenly spaced lines show the days on which we have samples in all of those periods for this particular thing. This is sort of a shocking absolutely predictable, precise change in relative amount of one from the other. In fact, it turns out that within one week, you can see the correct proportion of change going on in these things as time goes by. Phrases and themes change at different rates. They change in different ways, and yet the whales keep all these changes presumably in mind and keep updating their song version so as to keep pace with whatever is going on with whales that are nearby, all for reasons that we don't understand. If you look at a phrase which has several different forms as the year goes by, in other words, one that's changing very quickly, as in this theme here, we find that theme seven was composed, can we focus just this region of the slide, please? Theme one, theme seven rather, was composed of a series of uh, uh, different things which are demonstrated by different shadings. So we have some of that and a little of that, much less of that and much less of the black by the first period. This is the, these are the same five 31 day periods down below. In the next period, you can see that that particular thing has dropped out altogether. You can see much more black than there was before and about the same of these two other amounts. In this next period, you can see the black coming on even stronger, the white almost gone. By now we have nothing but pure black and by the last period, even yet a new version, which was something that didn't exist. This sort of fascinating change of material through time, this drift of changes propagating through the population, is something that we've been studying a lot now. And it turns out that many of the laws upon which whales construct their changes in their songs are very similar to the laws of human music. Now, um, the I'll try to give you a demonstration of that in just a second, but I want to sh point out this one more slide. This is the, just a picture of the flukes of a whale which is diving near Hawaii, and if you look carefully, you'll see that this left fluke has that sort of blackish portion in there and a line which goes up there and this line cutting down in from the corner and that line out there, whereas the other lacks those features but has some others which, if you look closely, are obvious. 
And it turns out that, not surprisingly, that animal looks different from all other whales. And so that whenever you can get a picture of the flukes of this individual, you can see um, who it is. And since whales, which are finishing breathing at the surface and starting to dive down below to continue singing, often show you their flukes, if you're lucky and are on the undersurface of them as they tip them up, I mean, if, you're, if your boat is in a direction so that you see the undersurface as the whale tips them up, you can then get a photograph and identify who the individual is. And we now have rogues galleries of tails that show us who they are. And we have hundreds of examples of whales that we can now recognize. But best of all is this particular individual who was heard singing on this particular occasion and then five weeks later was also heard singing and also had his tail photographed at that same time. And when we did that, we discovered that, gratifyingly enough, that singer had modified his song over that five-week period to keep pace with the changes which are occurring in the rest of the population. So that our supposition up until then, which was that the most parsimonious way of explaining the slow progress of changes was presumably true. If I can have the lights for just a moment, I will, I want to play an example of how whales can change their songs. I'll use a cello, not because it's the right choice of an instrument, but because it's the only instrument that I know anything el at all about or how to play. And uh, as you'll soon see, I don't know much about that. But if we start with a theme or a song which everyone is familiar with, or I hope everyone is familiar with, what I will do is to take that piece of human music and apply to it some whale song laws and slowly change it into another piece of human music which I think is familiar to all of you. That is, if I can make the microphone work. I want to start off with uh, something which is which is Scotland's Burning Around, which many of you may know, which goes like this. Now, when a whale... My voice is about to go because I have a terrible cold. When a whale sings its song, it... Ha it I'll show you one of the sorts of things that would be very common, and that is for the whale to repeat some one element a long time before going on to another. That song consists of four themes, and I will now show you what the whale might do in singing it a second time. a different number of times, one of the things that it often does is to start adding a note. This is one of the ways that changes can be made. So I will just choose a note and add it to this sequence that I've been playing, and the song becomes like this. thing which whales do is to drop out notes, not just add notes, but also drop them out. And so I'll choose a note and drop out a note, and the song now becomes different in a new way. So I left out. It used to go, and it now goes. Now another thing that whales do is they often make slides. When they're coming down from a note, they'll do this. When a whale has had a slide in one year, it very frequently in the next year or later in the same year breaks that slide apart into different elements. It sort of takes notes out of it. So this is one of the ways that new creations come is it's by dissection of material that's already there. So the slide could become like this. Now let's see what we have as a song. We have this.
Now, another thing that happens is that having taken a slide and divided it into a series of notes, whales often leave out some of the notes in the slide, and that's how you get new figures which are apparently unrelated if you don't only see them at different moments in time to what came before, but in fact are really derived directly from it. So you could get this from the slide now. As I mentioned before, there's such a thing as a uh, transition theme or a transition phrase, and I'll take the last phrase of this song, drop off a couple of notes from it, and then I'll tie it to the first phrase, having lost one of the notes from that phrase, so that you go, instead of this, you simply go so that you drop off one of the notes and then go on to the song that way. Recalling that whales slow down their songs as they go over time, we'll now take all of these changes, put them together, and slow them down. And you get this if you start the song in the middle. And incidentally, whales often start singing just anywhere. They don't necessarily start with what we call phrase one. Anybody who says that that's the theme from Close Encounters of a Third Kind will be thrown out. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I want to do one more thing before I've gone way over my time, and I'm sorry about that, but I want to take another minute and just tell you one last thing because I think it's so much fun that you may really enjoy it. The humpback whales aren't only demonstrating to people the sort of unusual and interesting brains that they have by singing long and complicated songs and applying to them the same laws with which human composers compose their music. But they also do another thing which has been discovered only very recently and which was so weird and wild when it was first told about by the man who discovered it, Charles Duraz, up in Alaska, that really none of us believed it. I didn't believe it, and Chuck was an old friend of mine, and I decided if I could get to him soon enough before he was lynched, that maybe I could help, sort of help him get back onto the path of righteousness and out of these crazy things that he was saying that humpback whales were doing. And so I went up to Alaska filled with missionary zeal and, of course, came back uh, realizing that he was absolutely right in what he was saying. What he was saying was this, that humpback whales are spinning nets made out of bubbles in which to entrap their prey. And when you go to Alaska and watch this behavior going on, what you see from the deck of a boat, if this blackboard has become the calm surface of the ocean, you see a bubble here, and a moment later another one there, and another one there, another one here, another one there, and so on, slowly progressing around a circle until, as you come near the end of this circle, at this moment, you see on the surface of this bubble a series of what looks like a little puff of wind going over it, or uh, rain falling in the center, but not falling on the outside. No wind outside here, just in the center. And that disturbance in the surface is thousands and thousands of krill, or small fish, whatever it is that the whale is feeding on, jumping at the surface. And then the whole surface of the water here is disrupted and uh, uh, destroyed by the head of the whale coming up, just completing the job of closing his mouth. Now what's happened is that the whale, now Chuck, who described all of this, said he thought that the whales were using it as a means of concentrating their prey. One of the people who, was on, who later went up to Alaska, who was on an expedition with us in Hawaii earlier, was Sylvia Earle, who took a krill net, I mean a net that would catch krill, and dragged it through a bubble net and next to a bubble net and she got about 10 to 1 in terms of concentration of prey inside the bubble net and outside the bubble net. So there seems to be little question. This is something one would like to repeat many more times, but so far based on the evidence that we have, there is certainly a concentration of the krill inside. 
Now, what on earth is preventing the krill from crossing through this curtain of bubbles which is being spun by the whale? Well, nobody knows. Presumably just the krill's own reluctance to do so. There's nothing else one would think of that would stop it. Well, why would krill ever do such a foolish thing as to allow themselves to be killed for their failure to cross a line of bubbles? Well, I would suspect that in the world of a krill, that when you, you come into a line of bubbles no normally, it means that you're about to go onto the rocks. In other words, you're seeing disturbance of waves from surf beating on a shore or something like that. So a very simple solution to the problems of avoiding danger of a krill would be to build into it a mechanism which says when you see bubbles turn in the opposite direction. And during 99.9999% of your life, that would serve you very well, but it wouldn't when you came and tr cut touch with a humpback. Now, when the humpbacks are blowing their bubbles underneath the water, they presumably go down about 50 to 100 feet. We don't know how far, but the considerations of how long it takes, as you'll see in a moment, the bubbles to rise suggest it's about that difference of time. When they go down and start blowing bubbles, I was interested to see whether they were actually vocalizing to each other and the bubbles were simply a consequence of that, even though most vocalizations of whales are not accompanied by the emission of air. And we know that singing is not, because when we see humpbacks sing, they're not releasing any air. They're just shuttling air around inside them somehow to make the sounds. We don't know how they make the sounds. But when, uh, when, w when this was going on, I thought that maybe the whales were calling to each other, something similar to, you know, get out of here, this is mine, or come over here, or whatever. And that these sounds fortuitously resulted in bubbles, and since the whale was swimming circles around its prey, why well, maybe that all had to do with... Uh, somehow generating a ring of bubbles which looked to us gullible scientists as though it was in fact a bubble net being spun by the whale. So I took with me a hydrophone when I went up to work with Chuck and started making recordings and discovered that when the whales are producing these bubble nets they are making no sounds at all, not the social noises of the sort that I gave you an example of before, not the songs, but simply the pure escape of air. And I'll give you now a sample of it. And you'll hear what sounds like a sort of steam engine going along. This is the release of pulses of air by the whale. And then you hear a sort of which is all the bubbles coming up to the surface of the water. And that eventually sort of drowns out the steam engine. Then you'll hear no more steam engine. The whale has stopped blowing bubbles and is now swimming like a piston through a cylinder up from the bottom, presumably chasing the krill ahead of it. And then you'll hear the whale uh, break through the surface of the water and blow. You can hear the breath of the whale which is recorded underwater, but is heard best by the person at the time through the air. Here we go. This is just background noise in the area. Hasn't begun yet. Begins now. That's the blow of the whale at the end. Now, because you heard the sounds being made of the whale releasing each column of bubbles, you can count the numbers of columns that the whale releases. You can compare it with the numbers of arrivals of bubbles at the surface of the water going around the circle, and you discover it's about the same. So presumably, what you're hearing is individual columns of air being created by the whale. That means there's a space between these columns equal to the space that you observed going around the ring. But better than that, you can time the length of time it takes the whale to blow the bubbles underwater from the first blow to the last blow. You can hear that. And you can time the length of time it takes the, the bubbles that are rising at the surface to come and rise to the surface because you can see those happening. And fascinatingly enough, it takes the whale longer to blow the ring than it takes the ring to appear at the surface. Well, the only way to explain that is that the whale is following a helical path upwards from the bottom as he blows his bubble net and comes to the surface. Which makes perfect sense when you realize that the earlier bubbles he blew have a head start on later, bu later bubbles that he blows, so if he keeps rising in a spiral, he'll be able to keep the whole thing sort of going at once. Now, if you drew a line, it gets even fancier, if you drew a line here to show progress in time from the right to the left, I'm going to choose it, well, no, I'll go left, I'll go the other way, that's fine. We'll say that we have the whale here at this moment in time, and he's just blown a bubble, and it's right there over his bowhole. 
blow hole, and it's just a great globe of gas which has inside it the potential of creating bubbles of every possible size, big ones and little ones and little inky dinky ones the size of soda pop bubbles which will probably rise to the surface, you know, five minutes after the whale has left the area and so on. But there's the one he blew just now, and the bubbles that rise fastest, here's the one he blew a moment before, here's the one he blew a moment before that, and a moment before that, a moment before that, and so on. These are bubbles of all the same size I'm drawing now. We'll look now for a bubble which is half the diameter of that one, and we'll find it along a different line, and we'll look for bubbles that are still only a quarter of the diameter of the first one, and then we'll look for bubbles which are only an eighth the diameter of the first one, and we'll find them along all these different lines that we've drawn here. Now, the distance between, uh, and here are the 15 blasts that the whale made. I'm trying to draw 15 lines and whatever the number it's supposed to be, 15 it isn't. But when the whale is blowing his bubble net, realize that there is a gap between these lines, which if the net is going to be sort of uniform in its coverage for confining prey, should mean that bubbles of a certain size will be at a certain spacing apart. The big ones will be very far apart as shown here and smaller ones will be ever lesser distances apart. So it would perhaps behoove the whale to select things in such a way so that the spaces between columns was the same as the spaces in the vertical plane between bubbles. Masa menos, I mean, just a sort of very rough thing. And all he has to do to do that, realize, is to simply follow up along any one of these lines as he's swimming, and he can select bubbles of that one size to arrive at the surface at the same given moment in time. So that's what we're trying to do this coming summer, is to test out that theory and see whether it's true and whether or not whales are, in fact, uh, blowing bubble nets which are uh, of, of a different mesh for a different prey. I've asked Chuck Jaraz about it, the man who really discovered this business, this phenomena of bubble nets first, and he says yes indeed he thinks it's true that he recalls seeing larger bubbles with um, fish than were used with krill. It seems to me, just in sort of winding up all of the remarks that I've been making now, that there's a question which is unanswered in all of this, which is the question of why whales sing. And in fact, I suspect that whales themselves might not be able to answer that question. I mean, could you answer the question, why are you singing, if somebody asked you, if you really were looking for the real reason? I feel that in human beings, songs are often used to express strong emotions, things like love and grief and religious ecstasy is another example. There are many others. And in the case of a great many different animals, which we uh, freely say are just making noises while we label ourselves as musicians and say that we sing, we forget about the fact that we call a lot of human singing, which is far less musical than what the humpbacks are doing, grunts and squawks and so forth, with which ethnomusicologists uniformly recognize as singing. We call a lot of human singing uh, by that name. Perhaps what we should do is to be somewhat broader in our definition of music and not be afraid to ascribe the fact that perhaps animals are making music as well, not just human beings, after all. Is there to be this forever gap between man and the rest of animals, or is it not, in fact, one of the examples of what we're learning about life, that there is an ever greater continuum between man and animals? When a frog is singing its song, it's putting a great deal of energy into doing it. It's obviously conveying an important message. There are good examples that when several species make vocalizations that they do so under what can only be or most at least parsimoniously be labeled as uh, some sort of emotional state of the animal. Perhaps one of the reasons that humpback whales are singing is to an express an emotion. And I don't know whether they do that or not. I only know that people do that. And maybe that's something we should start looking for. One of the strangest messages which was ever transmitted by music, in my knowledge, has occurred fairly recently. Back in 1977, two rockets were sent off from Canaveral, bound on a mission which would take them past Jupiter and Uranus and Saturn. And the momentum which they had as they were flung past the last of those planets was going to carry them out of the solar system, and they would spend the rest of their lifetimes, an estimated 1.2 billion years, wandering throughout the rest of the galaxy. That incidentally probably makes them the longest lasting man-made objects of all. And uh, during the time that they were wandering in this area, on the off chance, and it's a mighty off chance, that there's some other spacefaring civilization that might intercept these rockets, on board them were placed a series of recordings which included, among other things, greetings from 62 different human, uh, in 62 different human languages from members of the Secretariat of the UN, 
Um, there was some music. Bach is most represented, an interesting point, I think. Um, and there's also some humpback whale sounds. Um, in fact, this part of it interests me most because it was those very same sounds, um, which we, is some songs that we recorded, in fact, which we recorded on April 13th, uh, the night that I described to you. And I've often wondered, as I think about this, because it's a delightful thought to me, that the songs of humpbacks have now sort of s escaped from their ocean prison and overwhelmed the banks of the ocean and have overcome the hearts of their age-old enemy man and are now bound on this, this billion-year voyage which is going to spread them throughout the galaxy. It has occurred to me that perhaps when I was striving to see the difference between Gibbs Hill light and the star close to the horizon, maybe it was a star and not Gibbs Hill light, and perhaps it was the very star towards which those whale songs are bound. And on that note, I'll leave you. Thank you very much. I get another drink of water out here. I bet Dr. Payne would ask answer some questions uh, for a few minutes. <laughs>